Well, welcome aboard Wild Cards to an exciting Q&A with Shane Hensley himself. Today, we are talking about the science fiction companion, which is amazingly many thousands of times overfunded on Kickstarter right now. We got 48 hours left, 49 hours, I think, technically. So if you haven't gotten aboard, I'll throw a link in the chat right now so you can check it out. But the um, how you doing, Shane? Doing fine. Nice. So the uh, this one was a big challenge. I mean, this was probably a, a very highly anticipated uh, companion for us. People have been asking for it for a long time, and uh, we're happy to finally be able to deliver for folks. So, um, you know, what, what do you think was the, the unique challenge bringing the science fiction companion updated to Suede? I think with this one, it's just the overall complexity of the entire book, making sure that vehicles, walkers, power armor, robots, armor, weapons, everything balanced against each other, right? So that when you're playing your game and let's say you're doing like a Star Frontiers knockoff, right? And somebody picks up a rocket launcher to take out the enemy pirate ship that's about to blast up, blast off out of the spaceport, that it works like you think it should, right? Because a lot of times when you're deep in the, into the, the design of these things, there's kind of a, of a, a gestalt that takes place behind the scenes that you're working on so many things that you forget that the most common friction points for people are things like that, right? I want to pick up this weapon. It's meant to do this thing, and it doesn't. That's that's a killer, right? It, it's akin to getting an archetype that's poorly made, right? I've got a gunslinger with a low shooting skill or something like that. And... Uh, Getting that just right is why we're going to have a longer than usual feedback time on this book. Uh, there's just no way we can play test everything. We've play tested a lot. We have gone through it. We, we do read throughs where we all read it and see if it makes sense. Uh, that has been exhausting, but incredibly worthwhile. But there's still just no way we can test everything. Uh, a good example of that, if, if it doesn't maybe resonate for you, is I always think of this when, when I worked on uh, City of Heroes at Cryptic Studios, the big MMO, we would test a, a scenario over and over again with the designers in the building. Right. But then we'd release it to the world and we'd find all these problems. And the reason why is with six different classes. And again, this is a very small subset in an MMO where you can only do the things we let you do. Right. We, we, we would have any combination of those different classes, play styles, uh, things you could bring into the game from elsewhere, like uh, special rewards maybe that you picked up somewhere else, and just the way people play, and they would find all these issues. Now you take that to an, an RPG, which is completely subjective, right? You can have anything in the world in it. You could be fighting kaiju on a spaceship in the middle of the sunken of the hollow earth, right? And we just can't test everything. So we're going to have a longer than usual feedback period on this. I'm going to sit there and go through all the notes, me and the rest of the team, and address everything we find until we get it as perfect as we can get it for the print release. But the PDF version of it will come out pretty quick after Kickstarter actually sends us the funds and we know who actually backed it. A couple weeks. Yeah. No, it's excellent. So that, that leads into my my first big philosophical question kind of on design philosophy. I, I think one of the kind of the the major themes of science fiction and literature and film is that it expands human abilities easily. I mean, you can you can travel far distance easily, or you can you extend your life easily, or you have superhuman powers that come very easily, or weapons that do great things. So starships and all of your telekinetics and all those kind of things that they, it, I think one of the questions sci-fi leans into is 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 make it make it easy, right? And I think some other RPGs when they try to tackle science fiction kind of get bogged down and bloated in like huge lists of gear that might not be Fast Furious fun or just other kind of crunch. And because Fast Furious and fun is the Savage Worlds design philosophy, um, how have you leaned into that design philosophy in the Savage Worlds? Yeah, I mean, so we think about that with every single thing we do. And I would, I would say our process usually is to start with a complicated version. We start with, okay, how would this process work in real life? First you do this, then you do this, then you do that, right? And then you look at the totality of that task or system or whatever it is, and you say, okay, what is it we really care about here? I don't necessarily need to know that for net running, I have to log in and uh, do the handshake and you do all of the steps that you would really have to do to hack something. I really just need to 
make a roll to get in. Okay, cool. And then what does it do back to me to try to stop it, right? And we use dramatic task for that with some cool new twists. You'll see there are uh, active things you can do in a dramatic task to play with your tokens and do stuff with. We have that both for uh, net running and for vehicle battles. So we, we take the, the big, long, clunky process. We try to boil it down to what do I care about? subsume all those other tasks in that role so if if you want to add those details to the, to the description you can right but we don't need to have steps for them in in the process that's just tedious you know, we want to just boil it down to the thing that is the most fun and then get a good result right so we want you aced this thing you're the master of whatever it is you're doing or oh my god critical fail you're doing a net running, you just trip the alarms, they know where you're at, and an attack squad is on the way, right? And then a couple of things in the middle. And that's that's kind of how, when you know that the results are, are, you know, one of five, right? Critical success, success, failure, critical failure, uh, I guess four states, then, uh, then it, it helps you figure out how you're going to funnel all that into those, those answers, right? Perfect. So the um, one of the, the the nicest we've done in this campaign is there are actually two free live previews on drive through that folks can check out some of the, the crunch that we're adding. One of the uh, early questions, actually, this is really cool um, from Facebook user. If you're on Facebook and watching this on the post you're watching at, there's a little link at the top where you can actually give StreamYard the right to use your name and likeness so we know who you are. But Facebook user asks, what is the estimated page count? And uh, we just expanded that, right? It's uh, a pretty exciting number it's close to 300 it will probably be over 300 uh i just consolidated some stuff um so maybe it might be you know hovering right around that number but we haven't put the critter art in and if you know our companions we do the pawn sets with them so we have art for just about every critter xeno enemy in the book right so we can easily make it larger we're trying to figure out, you know, in printing, you're trying to get 16 page signatures. And that's why books are like 32 pages, 64 pages, 96 pages, et cetera. We will, it is most cost effective for us to uh, to hit a signature around that mark. I don't know off the top of my head what that would be, uh, but it'll be, it'll be right around there. It is a big, dense book. Yeah, that, that's super exciting. I mean, there, there's so much to cover in science fiction. Um, so it's great that this, this book is really covering so much of it. And the, um, but yeah, yeah, on those on those free previews, the, the first one that we released um, is uh, Stompy Robots. They're pretty on trend this year. Uh, Simon and I saw a lot of folks who are kind of uh, repping Stompy Robot properties when we were at Gamma two weeks ago. And um, that's actually one of the first things that, that we actually showed you guys for the rules. I'll post a link in the comments here momentarily, but we we'll call it. Add. I should add, Daryl actually ran a Battletech, a Savage Battletech campaign a few months ago using our rules. And hopefully he'll drop by here in a little bit and maybe tell us a little bit about it. The, um, oh, most excellent. So we're calling these walkers. There's a whole chapter on walkers. And um, the link is coming up for all you guys watching right now for the pre pre preview over on Drive Through RPG. But um, while you're here and watching us, um, what are some of the, the, the cool things that we are doing with walkers in this compendium? So I think the coolest thing actually is just making I'm going to I'm going to change subjects on you slightly. Sure. We have something called heavy metal. Oh, and, okay. and what that does is and there's a preview for that, too. What it does is uh, our, our we pride ourselves on getting our numbers as right as possible. Right. So when a, a heavy missile with a lot of damage and armor piercing ability hits a ship with a lot of armor, all that math works. Right. But that math is pretty clunky to do in the middle of what we hope is, you know, a fast, furious, fun chase. So what we've done is we've got a table that boils down weapon damage and the total toughness of mostly vehicles, right? Anything with high toughness and armor values and boiled it down into one of seven classes and changed it so that you uh, you just compare those two things. And then it gives you a, an answer just like that on whether you heard it or not. So you don't have to roll, you know, 5D10, AP30 versus the vehicle's toughness of, you know, 40 slash 24 kind of thing, right? Which, again, it all works. It's all there for the people who want that. But for those of us who maybe want to play a little faster and looser, you can just compare the class, roll the wounds, and boom, you move on. And why that's so great for walkers is because in a typical Battletech-style fight, you might have a dozen mechs running around the tabletop, right? 
and doing all that math would, would not be very fun. I know because I've done it. Now with classes, man, it just flies. It's so fun. And if you use the the, the vehicular dramatic task stuff we've worked in, it gives you even more options because it's not just do you make task rolls this turn. The tokens that you get, you can do things with them. They have extra effects. And that's really fun. It gives the pilot something else to do. It gives your engineer something to do. It gives gunners something extra to do, although they've generally got plenty to do. So it's, it's really fun. We're still play testing it, tweaking it, but it's it's good. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So if you guys want to check out how that all works, um, it is a, a an elegant simplification. And and that's another thing too is like, you know, as people have pointed out, I think kind of one of the, the major design challenges for sci-fi is sci-fi is huge. I mean, there you know, it goes from you know, slight, you know, little bit of magical kind of technology all the way to, you know, planet destroying lasers and time travel and just things that are very, very could be could be very crunchy. So I, I think this is a very elegant way of being able to narrow in on what you can really do damage to just depending on how big you are and then what, you know, how, how good your shields are. And, um, you know, just a, a nice range that, that covers um, a good chunk of what I think, you know, makes sense for, for for coming to your game table so um links are in the chat for that and then the um uh let me see any other good questions here we got the page count the um uh, I, I was looking up uh, I, I couldn't remember the the specific wording i was looking up. i think it's is it clark's law any sufficiently advanced technologies, technologies into signals yeah. from magic yeah right right and, and that's a, that's some of the cool things so someone asked a very good, good thing that's kind of uh, loops back into walkers and what else is in the book but um Graham Molotov asks I need mecha that can be piloted by psionics so are there psionics in the book are there arcane backgrounds are yeah there... There, there are I think there's a dozen new arcane backgrounds everything from like the chronomancer to the technomancer uh warp wizards or warpers are one of my favorites they actually channel the power of the warp so you can do some 40k kind of stuff cool. uh yes that's all in there yeah, a mech that's piloted by psionics that feels like a, a pretty particular setting to me it would use the piloting skill right now but if you want to say i'm using my psionics to do it sounds like you know a cool thing for cymex the setting right that's and that's that's something that probably needs addressing right so the people who are, you get this book i think more so than any of the other uh, companions are going to have to figure out what to do for their setting, right? Because even if we just did Star Trek and Star Wars, right? Those two genre, those two uh, properties are so different in so many ways. Like the base speed of ships in Star Wars are crazy compared to what they are in Star Star Trek, right? And I can't remember which one's more than the other all of a sudden. But if you look at them, somebody is going to get this book and go, wait, these ships don't move like the ones in Star Trek. So we have language in here that says, hey, this is our baseline that we think hits all these different shows and properties and books and things that you are that you love and want to convert. But you're going to need to look at, you know, the, those numbers for your, your particular setting and adjust them because we can't have a list of, well, here's how it works in Aliens. Here's how it works in Blade Runner. Here's how it works in, you know, et cetera. Although we do have uh, dev levels in this. So dev one is kind of the near future, which we, we think of kind of as aliens tech, right? Dev two would be more uh, Star Wars. And then dev three would be more Star Trek, where you have teleporters and uh, hologram, uh, the holo holodeck machines, that kind of stuff, right? It's, it's the ultra tech from the last book. So, uh, you know, we in fantasy, it was well, let's make sure we can play D&D &D and Warhammer and Pathfinder and Lord of the Rings. Right. Much more narrow scope. OK, it's elves and dwarves and their spells. And, you know, maybe it's grittier or dirtier or maybe it's a little more high fantasy, but it's 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 within this range. Sci-fi is just massive and covers so many different tropes. You know, Mad Max is sci-fi. Right now, this is not the post apocalyptic source book, but you can definitely make all the vehicles for Mad Max out of this book, right? All the way up to Star Trek ships. That's a pretty tall order. And I, you know, I think we did it, but you're going to have to take it and go, okay, this is what works for me as is. But in my campaign, we're doing this, right? Like, how many mod slots does a ship have? Well, we've got a good baseline, we think 
is, is good for you to play with and has some good balance. But you may say, well, in this universe, like Tracy Sizemore's Han cluster, right? They all have 10% more uh, mod slots in them for whatever reason, or they have less because it's a lower tech, less developed uh, spacefaring society, right? So those are the, the bells and uh, the knobs and levers you're going to have to tweak to make it work for exactly what you want. So uh, John Doom asked a very tough question. Um, which sci-fi IP, TV, movies, RPGs, do you think design the coolest spaceships and uh, what may be your favorites among those? You go ahead and go first. Uh, so uh, my recent favorite, I think it's probably the Rosinante from The Expanse because it's so different than uh, kind of the, the, the Star Wars, Star Trek kind yeah. of genre. Um, it's, it's, it's very brutally hard. Um, you know, and, and takes into account a lot of real physics that is kind of devastating. I mean, the whole idea that you don't have magical shields and that a very small object going very fast will just ruin your day. Yeah. And um, so I, I think that, that, that makes for some very interesting storytelling. Um, so I like that. And I think all time favorite has to be Millennium Falcon because, you know, it's like the hunk of junk in space that could. And Han Solo is yeah. the coolest space pirate. And there are space pirates in the book. So um, right. space smugglers too, whatever you would pirate smuggler. Uh, dashing heroes and leather vests, um, whatever yeah. it is. So I think those are, those those are I think the two that would stand out to me um, as cool ships. Okay, yeah, uh, the Resonante is good, and Resonante is a good example of you know everything that happened in Star Wars comes from uh, World War II dogfights, right? It comes from from Lucas and, and his buddy Spielberg, their uh, love of well, love of World War II, but their appreciation of the history and you know their interest in it, and that's why dogfights are the way they are. It's why ships make sounds in space in Star Wars, that and it would be boring without. And I think we've come in, in sci-fi, we've come a long way towards, well, these ships are never going to go in atmosphere. So they, they can be as blocky as they want to be. Uh, if you have anti-grav, the moment you have that, you can do things like we've seen in Dune, Dune and Dune 2, right? Where you, you have these blocks, these incredibly heavy blocks that just float around, you know, beyond any physics we can imagine today. So you can do whatever ships you want. As far as whatever ship I think is the coolest, you know, I think the Viper from Battlestar Galactica is probably one of my favorite. Yeah. There's something about it that just, I love Spitfires in World War II, and there's there's something between those two that feels kind of the same. And then that, the Cylon Raiders were really cool. You know, they're basically just, just discs. Yeah, they were cool. I liked them. You know, I mean, that's well, that, kind of one of the other things too. Is like, like you mentioned, like dogfights in World War II, very Star Wars, and I'd say Star Trek leaned into submarine warfare as their first model yeah. of what what things look like. So it's the torpedoes, oh, and you know, and you know, very much you know, echoing the the torpedo drama right. films that were the black and whites, and um, the, you know, the most realistic, um, faster than light battles that I have read are from the Lost Fleet. Uh, it's uh, the adventures of Commander Black Jack Geary. I can't remember the author's name all of a sudden, but it's a fantastic series. It is actually a series far more about managing people than it is sci-fi sometimes. But the sci-fi fights, they take place at fast with a light speed. So you know you're going to contact your opponent in 12 days, for example, right? Going in opposite, opposite directions. And he has to configure his fleet in different formations to best uh wreck the enemy fleet and protect his own right so it's all predictive you can't fire weapons at that speed the computers fire at all you know hours ahead of time mm -hmm. as they're you know whizzing through the air so sometimes they'll say we're going to make a rolling penny formation or we're going to make a you know a flying disc or a rotating disc all these crazy things depending on the capabilities of the enemy fleet their psychology what their weapons can do that's pretty fascinating and we have something like that in here. Uh, they're called vector passes, right? And you you set up how you want to do it. It is not uh, a round by round kind of thing because it's it's you know it's like shooting a bullet through an apple or shooting two bullets through each other. And you know you hope you got the bigger bullet. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, well, and that, really that's kind of where we are even in in modern like we don't do modern dogfights anymore, right? Because the you know uh, jets don't see each other anymore. The second there's right. a radar. Radar blip, yeah. you know, missiles fly and they go home and then the guys blow up. It's like, that's you right. know, doesn't make yeah. for great movies, you know, right? That's why they, they went back to the Top Gun recent movie, went back to the older style, you know, uh -huh. you know ships. But 
Um, those are the realities in space, right? You don't see your enemies. You, you fire something very uh, hard and fast at them. And, you know, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And it's, so. and it's a challenge when making a book like this, right? Let me, let me do, use a different analogy. So in superheroes, in, in DC comics, Batman always defeats Superman, but try writing rules for that because, because mm -hmm. Batman loses, right? Every single time. I don't care what kryptonite stuff he's got up his sleeve. You know, yes, you might be able to prepare a plan once or twice, but Superman can laser him from space. He can hit him before he knows that he's even there. You know, all these things in, in reality, right? But that's okay. The trope is more fun. The trope is more exciting and interesting. Sci-fi has that similar issue where Star Wars is popular. World War II dogfight style spaceship fights are popular, and we want to do them. So we have to accommodate that. But we also have to have... We have to accommodate the rivet counters, right? You say, well, actually, I'm going to launch a missile from four light years away, and I, I have no idea what's going to happen until three days later what happens, that kind of realism, right? And those are the kinds of things we have to, to balance and accommodate and figure out how to handle in the rules. And usually what we have to do is choose this is kind of the median of those things. And if you want to go to one of the extremes, there might be setting rules for it. There are for some things, or you might just need to tweak it for a particular setting. And what I think would be a real opportunity for some of our ACE licensees would be to take those different data sets and say, if you want to do all, uh, you know, Flash Gordon style versions of all these weapons, here's, here's our take on it. If you want to do crazy, super realistic versions of all the missiles and so forth, you know, here's our take on it and, and dive into that. Maybe it's for a, a specific setting or maybe it's just extra data sets people can use for their super hard, hard sci-fi or super space opera setting. Again, we got to kind of do the baseline because we can't have 20 versions of every missile in the book, right? No, no, very true. And I, I think the simplicity and elegance is what we are aiming for, right? I mean, to right. avoid the extensive list, like give people what, what, what they can trap, use trappings for to fit into their setting. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of the elegance of Savage Worlds, right? You, you, you don't need um, 5,000 versions of a phaser or a blaster um, you could just trap the you know, the ones that we do have to fit the, the particular flavor, whatever setting you're going for. Right. And um, we I mean, we have light, medium, and heavy, right, for, for blasters in particular. And that ought to give you every, whatever you want. But if I was doing a particular setting, I would give them corporate names. And, you know, this corporation's guns are known to kick a little bit more. And this corporation's guns fall apart, but they're really cheap. That's the kind of extra flavor you can add in your setting. This is not a setting book. Right. This is the baseline for all of those. Perfect. The um, bunch of, of really good questions coming in. So the um, uh, let's see, there was a really good one um, from Clay asked, will we be updating or including the salvaging rules from the previous companion? From sci-fi, uh, they are not in there at the moment. We will see. Right now it's, it's you know, it's 300 pages. Salvaging feels like something more for the post-apocalyptic companion down the road. But we will see. Cool. The um, let's see. Um, but the main question I hope is: uh, Do shields still function like the vehicle no. guy? So the way shields work in our playtest right now is they have a number of shield charges. You have more of the bigger ship you have, and after you uh, account for damage, they give you soak rolls. Okay, and they uh, you have to use them. So if you've got three shield tokens and let's say you take three wounds and i soak two with the first i have to spend another token to try to soak the second because the shield's trying to stop it all once you do that then you can also you can use your ace edge or whatever else you might have equipment wise to do that with their soak rolls perfect the um let's see i think i think we've answered this one thank you, but just in case the previous sci-fi companion had mechanics for shields and battery of weapons have these changed uh, so shields I just talked about, we have combined fire in the vehicle rule. So yeah, like a destroyer that's got a, a ton of weapons on it, you can combine all that fire and just make one ball. Yes. That's so easy. Yeah, right. Length weapons is great. The, um, Sean Marrow asks, will there be rules for making a hero ship? I don't know what a hero ship is. So um, probably like like your own ship for your group. Like you want to create it. You know, can yeah, you create a starship? Any ship you want in the book. Nice. That's excellent. And... Um, Let's see. Question about converting all of this massive damage to rifts. Is it compatible or do we need to homebrew it? Or So what we did is we're, we're making this compatible with Suede and the other companions and, and all the core stuff. 
Yeah. We uh, we know that Rifts will be a little overpowered compared to this. So the Rifts team is actually meeting right now, which is where uh, Daryl is and may join us in a bit to discuss some of that. So we're not sure if it'll just be a, a conversion or a, you know an easy tweak or something like that. But Rifts is a little overpowered compared to the rest of, of Suede. When we did uh, the Adventure Edition, Clint and I uh, brought in the values for all like, you know, M1 Abrams tanks and heavy missiles and all the crazy stuff like that because they had gotten a little ex uh, uh, exploded. So we, you know, we, we brought that in, made it, we had a formula based on, you know, real world uh, everything, you know, armor thicknesses and penetration values and all this kind of stuff. We do all that behind the scenes so that you can just look at it and go, okay, subtract 10, right? But, but it, it is a complex equation. And this is 100% compatible with that. You know, Rifts is, is a little more based on the original Rifts. So not so much, you know, reality because a lot of the stuff doesn't exist in reality. So it will be a little bit different, but we'll have, we'll have some way to address it. Great. Yeah. So, you know, another, another Facebook user asked whether this will be compatible with like the pulp end of sci-fi, like Slipstream or. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. So good. So good. The um, yeah, people are very excited. I mean, the, I think this has been one of the, the, uh, oh, here we go. Um, TARDIS. So uh, what about timey wimey uh, time wizardry? What is there anything? Uh, we, have a, we have a chronomancer. Okay. And he has quite a few cool abilities. One is uh, essentially reverse tactician where you can change the cards of you know other people. Uh, he has a few other cool abilities that I think you know, kind of falls into the whole time Lord concept. But generally, time travel itself, we think, is more of a, a setting slash adventure kind of thing, right? We don't really have rules for time travel per se, because that's 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 kind of its own thing, right? Like, can you affect things? Can I go back in time and you know kill Hitler before he becomes Hitler? All that kind of stuff. That is way outside the scope of what we're doing. But having chronomancers go back in time to do that, you know, some sort of secret agents of time kind of thing is absolutely something you can do with the book. You just got to define the parameters of what, what can we affect? The, um, so it, it, qualitatively fuzzy answer versus technical answer. Um, how, how major are the changes and the updates from the original sci-fi companion? That's, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's three times the size, more than three times the size, right? So, on the one hand, if you flip through them both, you'll go, well, there's, you know, more or less the same chapters. Uh, there's just a whole lot more of everything. But, you know, first off, it's just crazy streamlined from what I did, you know, pretty much by myself back in, in 2014. It's 10 years old. Uh, it is pre-swayed. So a lot of the stuff we figured out since then, you know, weren't in there. So, you know, limited actions and limited free actions are a huge deal, right? Um, you will see that in the effects of, of things throughout the books, but sometimes if you could do things three times a turn, it would be completely broken. So, you know, we used to just say you can only do this once a turn. Now we have limited actions and it makes the, the language very, very clear. So those kinds of uh, very picky internal tweaks have gone through everything. As I mentioned earlier, it is all balanced against each other very carefully. Um, the new stuff that I think is exciting is heavy metal, as I mentioned before, you know, being able to, to, to do um, weapons versus armor very quickly. I think the arcane backgrounds are, are pretty exciting. Um, if you saw what we did in um, fantasy and horror, you know, it's very much akin to that where these, you know, they're, they have all the, the plus sides of classes, I think, where they have their own fun, cool tracks they can do, but they're not classes. You're not rigidly locked into them, but they open up new possibilities. Uh, the setting rules, I think, are really good. We've simplified, you know, gravity, atmosphere, pressure, all that kind of stuff for those who want to do, like, the expanse, you know, things that are a little more realistic. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the weapons have been cleaned up. They've made, been made more consistent. So we have, like, you know, light, medium, heavy for everything, and then some things have uh, super heavy and so on. But, you know, most things are, are very easy to tell what it is, what it should be used against, that kind of thing. So, man, it's just a lot of detail work. Yeah, no, that that is fantastic. The um, is a really good question. Let me go find it uh, again. Um, okay, so the uh, degenerate with dice um, says that he really loves the fact that Saturday Flash Gordon setting has 
romance rules because that really fits that setting. One of the ones I want to ask you about, um, because this fits my my Dune um, fetish, is um, space betrayal. What there there are actually rules for political betrayal in this in this setting. There is. So it's the same ones from the Fantasy Companion, which we used to uh, for Game of Thrones style games, right? But I think they fit exactly, just as you said, I mean, Dune was, was top of our mind when we said, should this be in the Sci-Fi Companion? Hell yes, because of Dune. Nice. Okay, good. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> the um, uh, So let's get to some more um, customer fan wildcard questions. The uh, Among the shields, do we have personal shields? Like Speaking of yeah. Dune. Does the slow blade penetrate the personal shield? Uh, not per se, but we have personal shields, yes. Nice. Awesome. Excellent. The um, Let's see. Will the space combat be able to handle different things like the dogfights from Star Wars we mentioned before and then yes. battle stations like Star Trek? Yes. Okay. Can handle anything. Good deal. Um, here's a great question because... Um, this is a very hard one to do in the other system that I tried this in because either you had to have a group of all Jedi or no Jedi because Jedi were just uh, way imbalanced to everybody else on the scene. But um, Mystics asks, um, how will you balance the Jedi <clears throat> Sinites uh, in the new companion? So we have uh, two versions of it. One is uh, a Mystic, uh, Mystic Powers version. That's the kind of the light version of a Star Warrior. And, you know, they they have a vow to something and they get the cool mystic um, mystic powers edge. For those of you who don't know how that, how that works, it, it's an automatic thing, right? You spend the power points, the power goes off. You don't make any rolls, but it's, it's kind of limited. We also have the Star Knight uh, arcane background that is, you know, there, there's no lying about it. It's the Jedi, right? Serial numbers fought, filed off. And because it just fits within our arcane background framework, it's balanced like everything else. I, and I, I feel I feel your pain, my friend, because you know you watch like uh, the early Clone Wars cartoons or something. You, know, you wonder why why does anybody have an army when a Jedi can kill you know a million people and a thousand tanks in a day, and then you know in a different show you know they can be shot in the back. So the it's just like superheroes, right? It's whatever the author writer needs at the time. But we're a game; we have to keep these things balanced. And fortunately, we already have that system in place to handle them. Yeah, uh, everybody's freaking out in the chat about the post-apocalyptic companion name drop. So the uh, so we have had in mind post-apocalyptic pulp and martial arts for a while. We kind of outlined what's going to be in them. We actually have the creatures for the martial arts companion. They were written several years ago, sitting on my hard drive. They'll all need to be updated now. So they're on the they're on the radar. They're not on the schedule yet. Yeah. Right. We had to get the first four big ones done. And then all those others can be more resources than all kinds of new rules and stuff. The um, most excellent, most excellent. The um, let's see. Uh, Sean Maras, how does it handle exploration like archaeology, anthropology, alien worlds? Are, are there a lot of new alien species and oh, there, uh, backgrounds? There, there are quite a few new alien species that we've pre-made for you. And we have all kinds of new ancestral abilities that you can make whatever the heck you want. We have a whole chapter on artifacts that the GM can drop in so you can do exploration for X kind of, uh, you know, planet hopping exploration campaigns. Yeah, uh, really, really good, really good. Okay, so there's a bunch of questions that I, I'm going to take. Um, let's see. I closed the window with my questions. The, um, I will reopen the window with my questions because there's I had a whole list of um speed round questions on what is it in the book or not in the book. We're all going to go look that up. Um, but while I do, let's pop a um, uh, uh, bestiary question. Bestiary, bestiaries, whatever, however you pronounce it. Um, I we'll say bestiary because it's full of beasts, right? It's not full of bests. Maybe it's the best beasts. <laughs> uh, it's a huge uh, bestiary. It includes all the stuff from the original plus tons more. What are the inspirations, man? Everything that we've watched, right? Plus, oh my gosh, uh, other games. You know, we, we want to make sure you can play aliens with it. So there's there's Xenos that are basically aliens, right? We try, you know, we want you to be able to play aliens. We try not to rip off aliens. That means that's important to me. It's hard to do, but I, I think we do it. So the, you know, the stats are there for an alien-like creature. 
and it does all the things you would expect an alien to do. But we don't, you know, we don't use any of the names or anything else. And you can interpret, you can change, add whatever you want to it. But all that's in there. You know, giant worms definitely in there. Hi, several. There are several giant worms. Um, yep. And then I was, I was very pleased. The uh, so Mystic asks. Um, how how non-humanish uh, do we lead into on some of the you options? Can play an alien, uh, an, an energy form. You can play a turtle guy. You can play a yeti. You can play a gelatinoid. They're pretty alien. You can play a parasite that lives in something else. Oh, oh that's exciting. The um, that's very on 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 uh, on brand for for Star Trek too. The um, so Corey, Corey, welcome aboard, friend. Good seeing you, buddy. Hi, Corey. Um, uh, so if you if you're just there are like a hundred and some people watching the stream, which is a really great numbers for us. Um, so if you if you if you are brand new, um, we have a science fiction companion on Kickstarter right now. It is fully funded. It is rapidly approaching 300k and 3,000 backers. So thank you for the abundant enthusiasm you've all shown for it. I'll pop a link in the chat here in a second. Um, but we do have two free previews on Drive Through RPG. I'll post those second and third. One is to the Mecca. The, we call them walkers in the book. And the other is to heavy metal, which is a great way to simplify the rules for big guns versus big shields and just how that needs to scale between the immense kind of scale that you can really have in sci-fi. And um, it the, also uh, speeds things up, not just in the uh, the calculations, but wounds come a little faster if you're using the right weapons against the right targets. It just uh, it, it, it kind of it's kind of a half measure between simulating several rounds at once versus actually doing that. But it just makes things go a little faster because it's tricky with vehicles, right? Because we want your ship to be able to take quite a few hits before you just explode in space and everyone's dead, mm. right? We want you to be able to, oh, no, our engines are knocked out. Let's go fix them. Oh, crap, the shields are down, you know, those kind of situations. But you need to be able to pop the enemies pretty quickly. So this has, uh, this has a lot of that built into it. Yeah, I, I do know the answer is yes for transhumanism and mods and the tech, but uh, folks are asking along the protomolecule line or steampunk cyborg or also just mutation. Are there any rules in here for kind of the biological version of transhumanism? No, that would be more of the post-apocalyptic book. But I mean, all the, the abilities that are in here could certainly be made into any of that that you wanted to. Yeah. Just how you trap it, right? Yeah. The um, trapping. Excellent. So yeah, the um, yeah the answer creation options are pretty exciting. There's a big chunk of that. Um, oh, uh, I see. Well, uh, Buff Dragon's getting very specific. Um, uh, do we have a rules for how the parasite might control the host? Um, is there a fight for control? So uh, the 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 ones we have in the book now right now are very similar to the um, the debtors that we had in last parsec. But we have kind of two ways to go. There's kind of the quick and dirty version of I live in this host and if it dies, I die. And that's that's pretty much a standard package like um, the debtors or the parastine from uh, Last Parsec. The second way to go is uh, the transhuman approach where you make the little critter or the energy being or the mind control or whatever it is you want to make. And then you take over different bodies. And then, you know, the further of uh, the further you get from your core, the more dissonance you have. And there are drawbacks to that. Yeah, that's super exciting. So before I get to my lightning round of will it or won't be, will, will it or won't it be in the book, um, what's hard light and, and how does that work in the setting? So we have a we have it pops up in several places. We have a, an arcane background currently called hard light controller, though we, we may there's some debate about whether we want to nail it to that trapping or not but it is it is a sci-fi version of of green lantern essentially right you can make objects out of a projected light that has mass to it um the debate is you know whether we want to keep it to that or there's other matter or so on we have other things that control matter though so probably not there's also um there are some hard light uh, bits of equipment that have very specific uses in uh in the, the gear section so that's what hard life is oh that's super exciting super exciting okay so uh lightning round before we close out just taking uh, more audience questions um okay so w will there be uh transhumanism and cyberware yes hacking and net running yes outpost logistics salvage trade uh there's outposts which are yeah. the bases for this book 
salvage is, is uh, salvaging um, the ships that you capture and so forth. That is in here. If, if I misunderstood the person's earlier question, scavenging is not in here. That's what okay. I should have. I should have clarified. So salvaging the stuff you kill is it's a big deal, right? Because you take out the pirates. You want to go sell the ship? You just blew up. Right. Got to make the money. The um, atmosphere and gravity hazards. And pressure. Yes. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, power armor. Yes. Uh, can I'm a you big fan of Armor by John Stakely, one of the best books ever. If you've ever read Vampires uh, or saw the movie Vampires with the dollar sign at the end, same author. He wrote two books. And armor is fantastic. The, the core, the, the core cool point of armor is power armor kind of thing. You know, it feels a lot like Starship Troopers. But uh, the main character, Felix, constantly feels doomed. It's, you know, overrun by insect kind of things. And what they finally figure out of his psychology is that he believes he is going to die every time they drop him. And there's a mistake. He gets dropped way more times than he's ever supposed to. But he says, but that bug's not going to kill me. And that bug's not going to kill me. And that bug's not going to kill me. And at the end of it, he's the one who lives through all this stuff. Nice. It's fantastic. The, uh, I, I really do like the, I mean, uh, Starship Troopers, the original um, fantastic book, but it's the, the the middle chunk of the book is very much a treatise on citizenship. Mon- yeah, citizenship <laughs> and like the mundane like life in the military. Oh, but yeah. like it opens and closes with some really cool like drop ships and alien you know, bugs. Yeah. Um, like Old Man's War, War is really good. Oh, it's so fantastic. Good. You know, I think it's great, too, because the book is so very different than the movie. The movie had a whole different point to make, but I love them both. I think they're both great at what they what they were going for. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah vastly different. Like, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. They're really they're both yeah. very, very good. The um, OK, can I, if I'm a player character, can I play a robot? Yes. Um, let's see. Could you build spaceships? In fact, thanks to Tracy Sizemore. We have a it, it never sometimes, you know, we build a particular version of something knowing that you can make a different version, but we forget maybe a lot of people just need that basic version. So we have a lighter version of artificial being in this one. You don't have quite as many abilities as the construct or the Android in Swave. So you can kind of stack what you want on top of it and not uh, lose out on so much or be beholden to so much in the beginning. So we have a lighter start and then you can build with the robot modifications, which is a whole chapter in itself. You can make whatever the heck you want. You, know, you can play a little flying drone, you can play a giant war bot or, or C-3PO. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Asheris, uh, so we already have two two pre previews that are already out. You can download them now. But um, for backers, um, what do you think is our timeline? So when we close, the, the the normal process is Kickstarter takes about three weeks to get everybody's money, right? Because some people don't pay, some people have a, an issue, whatever. So take about three weeks, then they pay us. And it's not about the money for us. It is about what is the backer list. Right. Because those people that drop out, you know, they get dropped from the the reward, of course. Right. So we need that final list to say who gets uh, the preview or gets the, you know, gets the file sent to them. So that takes about three weeks afterwards. The file should be ready at that point. Um, We do have some late art. Sometimes when we do the alpha play test, we just put, you know, art to come in there and let you know that it's on the way. But we don't want to hold up the file any longer. That might happen because it's just such a big book and we don't know exactly where all the holes might be for art just yet. We're doing this one a little more um, uh, bespoke, right? So when, when I have a, a space at the end of a, a section that looks like a great place for art, I will order that specific piece of art rather than just trying to find something that looks kind of vaguely like it fits there, right? We want it to, to match better. Perfect, perfect, perfect. The um, let's see. And Nelson um, asks, "Can I make Cowboys versus Aliens with the help of this companion? Will it be balanced?" Yeehaw! There we go. That's all we need to know. The um, so let's see. Um, a lot of questions about like uh, powers, arcane background, ancestral abilities. Um, so I'm going to ask: Are there any of those things for time travel or time yeah. travelers? Awesome. Uh, shapeshifters. Yes. Okay. Technomancers. Yes. Uh, gravity manipulators. Yes. Space mystics. Yes. Okay. The um, okay. So they're really cool, by the way. They uh, Brian Reeves had this cool idea about using the music of the spheres. If you've ever uh, read you read that ancient Greek, in fact, uh, idea, but it feels very spacey, you know, to me. And we 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 based the whole class around or the arcane background around that, and I think it came out really cool. It's, yeah. It's into celestial bodies. 
right? Yeah, and I really like what you've done with like, so so interestingly enough, like one of the big things in sci-fi, it, it, it mirrors a lot of the same questions like religion uh, either seeks to answer or asks. Um, like, you know, why are we here? Where are we going? What's the meaning? Right. Um, and and there are, are several properties that are vastly different in tone from like 40K, which definitely leans into a lot of like space Catholicism or uh, whatever, to other properties. Like there are multiple kind of like space priests in here. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted everything from, I'm afraid I don't remember his name, but the, the preacher from Firefly that's on the ship, right? The, Book. Yeah played by Ron Glass. Yeah. Well, we wanted a guy like that. We wanted the chaplain from 40K. Uh, and we have we have a chaplain and we have a shepherd that is, you know, more like more like the other guy. Uh, and of course, you know, you can play you can play a priest right from the core book as well, or from Horror Companion, which I think works really well in like a 40K kind of environment, especially like a Eisenhorn Inquisition kind of thing. But yeah, there's a lot of that in here. Fading Suns, you know, you could play that with all this. They have some really cool trappings like that. Yeah, no, like, or like even like Event Horizon, it leans very oh, heavily yeah. into like demons. Oh, my favorite like, movie. All of a sudden, oh, so creepy. I was I was too young when I watched that one. I was like, oh my oh. God, space is scary. Oh, so good though. That, that, Our that, Unity that Adventure me. is definitely inspired by Event Horizon. Nice, oh, that's so good. Okay, so um, foes, allies we come up against. Um, are there bounty hunters? Yes. Corporate executives? Yes. Cyborg commandos? Yes. Death worms? Yes. Combat drones? Yes. A atomic elementals? Yes. Gene thieves? Yes. Uh, gray goo? I feel like somebody has fed you this list perhaps. Uh, right? I, I might have just gone through. Uh, the yes, yeah, so there's gray goo as well. <laughs> that's awesome i mean like gray goo so some people asked about the proto molecule proto molecule is like gray goo plus magic right like that's yeah yeah you know, i think so yeah the um, living planets um if you have it on your list i'm gonna guess brian made one but yes. i haven't seen that myself so we'll say yes okay yes brian did um neo dolphins because everybody needs I their own sequest the psv yeah, yeah. I have the art for it so it must be in there and, and then the two best ones ever in the history of space, space pirates and space cowboys. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, guys, um, we'll just take a bunch of um uh, audience. <laughs> right. Yeehaw. Um uh, we'll take a bunch of uh, last minute audience questions because um it's we're we're pulling it on an hour, but the um uh oh Libby asks, um, can we get Landau to do his best Yoda voice saying something like uh sci-fi companion you will buy, yes? Uh, just because. Okay, there we go. We have we have successfully crossed that one off. Um, oh, here we go. So Venkel, Venkel is a connoisseur of our Savage World stuff. Will this book have ribbons? Three. Three, okay, excellent. Maybe, maybe we'll go for a fourth, Venkel, since it is such a big book. That's I'm true. looking at my copy of Suede here with its beautiful three ribbons and thinking, you know, four might actually be useful for such a big book. Nice. The um, we have not decided on the colors yet, but if you wanna if you wanna annoy Simon, Simon I think makes final choice on what matches yeah. the trade dress. So but the, yeah, they, they will be complementary to the trade dress. The um this one is a definite yes because I, I I've been sneaking into the book and peeking around and um Cryptrite, who's our friend, um asked space factions, make a corp generator. So in the very, very back right now, there is a whole bunch of the there's a United Confederation, the Tanzanian Dominion, the Regellian Empire, the Paradimensional Empire, and more. So we do do a little heavy lifting on you want space factions? We give you space factions. Yeah, and, and we have to be that that's a it's it's a great point to, to quickly uh, focus on because you know this is not a setting book. It is a a foundational book for you to to make your setting off of, right? That said, we know a lot of people like to play. You know, Star Frontiers, generic, uh, last parsec, you know, generic kind of hop around planets and fight things. So we want to provide not just monsters, but a few examples of, you know, here's what a horrible alien slaving empire might look like. That, that's the Rigelians, right? Or like the uh, the cat people from, I can't remember what they call, uh, the Kazath something, from Wing Commander. Right? Yeah, the, Kill right? Rocky. Kill yeah, Rocky, Kill Rocky. good job. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, uh, you know, one of our, the Tazanians are, you know, that, that kind of uh, feel, you know, if it's, if it's a common or a shared trope that I think most of our 
readers, users, players will will get, it's in there. All right, excellent. The um, let's see, Traveler in the Umbra asks, will the uh, book discuss the noir side of cyberpunk rather than all being chromed out? Well, that's not really a rule, right? That's a setting and a feel and an atmosphere. So I think that's more of a setting thing. We have cyberware, uh, you know, how how you frame it and what it costs to get. You know, that's that's something I would do through. A, I, that's where I would focus on is in the setting. So no, not really in our book. Cool. Um, on those walkers, uh, can can the walkers handle transformers? Yes. yes. That was an enthusiastic yes. Yeah, I mean, so well, Daryl and I had a long, a day long, you know, conversation and then test of how to how do you make Bumblebee or you know Optimus Prime or something like that, and and we did it mostly Daryl. Nice. Giant the, space uh, Yes. <laughs> right. The answer is yes. The um, let's see, uh, interesting random question about the music that we do for the waiting music. Um, it's called. Yeah, it is licensed. I think you can find it on an Invato or Adobe license. It is called, um, let me get you the name for it real, real quick because it's random. Uh, Power and Drive Modern Rock. Power and Drive Modern Rock. And uh, yeah. um, oh my God, it's every, everyone with the stompy robots Voltron, Voltron, EVA. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, Let's see. Uh, I think Voltron is going to be big in the next couple of years. Just, just, just a hint. Hey, just a hint. Um, not with us. It's not a – Pinnacle's not doing it. Well, yeah, there, there was an announcement I just read yesterday that all of the Macross shows are coming to Disney Plus this next year. So Ooh. if you want to jump in on a one flavor of Stompy Robots, all of it is basically coming to Disney Plus. So, um yeah, yeah, yeah. No. The um, so telepathic hamsters. I think sure. that's a very <laughs> sure. Why not? Astro bad. Right, it's the diminutive creature with the psycho AB. Right. There we go. Um, <laughs> this one is definitely. I, I, it's, it's one of those that the Hanna Barbera, right? The Thundar. Yeah. So, so for those who haven't heard, I, I have tried to get Thundar. I have gotten in touch directly with uh, Warner Brothers, who owns it. They barely acknowledge that they own it. Uh, when I finally got a yes or no out of them, they, they just said, this is not available for licensing at this time. So I actually offered to try and buy it, to do, you know, whatever whatever it would take, because I just, I just love it. And I just could not get a response out of them. So, you know, maybe a very large company like a Hasbro or somebody like that could get some traction, but none for us. At this point, I think we'd probably just make our own anyway. Yeah. The um, well, welcome, welcome. No, no problem joining late, Vinny. The answer is a resounding yes. Um, so not only is the the most recent Flash uh, Flash Gordon release from us uh, sway compatible, but yes, the 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 romance in space uh, pulpy elements are near and dear to us. So that is, of course, going to be in the companion. So uh, and it covers that all the way up to hard sci-fi like the Expanse and all that cool stuff too. So. Yes. Let me let me qualify it just a little bit. Like on the weapons, like we don't have heat rays right we have weapons that you can uh retrap however you want but you know they just have a you know this is a beam weapon and it does x amount you could call that a heat ray or a death ray or whatever so i would i would take those exact staffs that we have read how it works make sure it you know fits your description of how you know your pulp weapon works and then and then it's a trapping but there are so many weapons and so many different ways that they work it'll handle everything we did in flash gordon and slipstream for sure the, um, so folks, we are coming up on the hour. And uh, so one more time, I'm gonna give you the links in case you, you're you just turning in. So we have the um, Savage Worlds Suede Adventure Edition Science Fiction Companion on Kickstarter now, 48 hours remain. The uh, It has been an amazing campaign so far. Uh, thank you to everybody who has already backed us. And um, let me pop in and let's see, comments. How did I lose it? Oh, there we go. Uh, um, so yeah, that's the comment. It's in the it's a, that's the link. It's in the comments wherever you're watching from. As we're on like all the platforms, the um, click on that. You can go check out the campaign. Um, close to three thousand of you wild cards have already backed, um, which is really really great. And um, so that's the link there. If you want a little taste, the uh, you know the first two samples are free before you buy. We do have two free um, previews on Drive Through RPG. Let me throw those links as well. So the first one is for Stompy Robots and, and all their great forms. We call them walkers. 
And uh, that is the link for the walkers. You can check out a little bit of the rules for those. It's not the whole chapter, but just a nice little preview of what that can look like for you guys. And then the other thing is heavy metal. And uh, because we do like to keep it fast, furious, and fun and not bog down uh, you know, all the possibilities with too many rules, um, Shane and crew have come up with a very great way to figure out just you know quickly balance big armor versus big laser kind of or big weapons um, and, and make that work uh, fast and effective for your game. We're calling that heavy metal. And so that link is down there. So you can preview that as well. And um, the uh, other than that, I think I'll turn it over to Shane for uh, some final words. Cool. So, uh, you know, huge project, big team effort. Uh, Sean Robertson, uh, Mike Barbo, Simon Lucas, Daryl Hayhurst, Tracy Sizemore, Clint Black, and all the, the usual gang, Don Shepherds, all the usual folks have, have, have helped with this tremendously, which for something this big and this expansive, you, know, you just have to have. So thanks to all of those people who, to, who took you know, on, on such a, a huge task. Um, and there are some cool little Easter eggs in here. So in the bestiary, you will find some things that might tie you into some of the stuff that happened in Necessary Evil and superpowers companion right so you know we we look at it as a their companions their toolkits but there's these little linkages in there if you look a little bit that will make things kind of cool and extra right i think that's fun on a sadder note <clears throat> we lost uh one of rpg's original founders yesterday <clears throat> with uh, jim ward and that was that was really sad jim was a, a friend and uh, one of my earlier jobs for TSR was working on converting all the weapons for Metamorphosis Alpha, uh, the version that was done for the Amazing Engine. Uh, I met uh, Jim then, and I got to you know talk with him at many conventions. The guy was always just you know full of smiles and, and happy anecdotes, and uh, you know standing up for the little guy, and, and everybody just loved him. You know, we he will be missed. So I, I would be remiss, uh, you know, not not mentioning him tonight. Two of our very close friends uh, of our company also lost their fathers uh, in the last day or so. Uh, Tim Early, who did holler for us, lost his uh, dad uh, yesterday, I believe. And my buddy, George Veselakos, who I've done tons of things with for the last 20 years, he lost his father. So, uh, you know, we it's, it's sometimes it's hard when, when you're hit with a, a bunch of stuff like this to come on and, and hype your product and be all happy and, and try to, you know, push past all that, but we have to do that. That is part of the job. And, you know, we, we know that you are owed uh, previews and answers about, you know, what's in this book. So, you know, we, we, we do our best to promote on days like this with respect, but we certainly do send our condolences and have a lot of uh, uh, thoughts and, and, and hopes that our friends can get over these, these tragedies, right? Cause it, it is tough. Uh, Chris, Chris and I have both been through it and it is, it is a life changing event. But Onward and Upward, which is what sci-fi is all about, it is aspirational. It's about hope and for a better future. And hopefully we will give you better rules to play with than you've had in the past and make your sessions even more fun and exciting. Oh, good. beautiful words. So with that, folks, we will be back <clears throat> on Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, um, an hour before at 6 p.m. to uh, our own Jam DeFogey. We'll be doing a Savage Universe stream with Hellbind, which is a science fiction setting by an ace licensee. So uh, show up at six and then come back at seven. And we're going to do the final hour of the Kickstarter. We're going to be counting down uh, this, the Kickstarter. So bring the rest of your questions to that session and we'll have some more folks and we will answer some of the questions like what's the next project um, as well during that stream. So uh, we appreciate you tuning in today with us and uh, go out there and um, play some Savage Worlds, folks. With that, other than that, um, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll see you in two days. Uh, same sci-fi time, same sci-fi channel, twitch.tv slash Cheers, Wildcards. Thanks, everybody.